Thank you, Tyler. I would now like to invite Father John Brown, the chaplain of the St. Louis and Ninth Art Society, to begin our evening with an opening prayer. Let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty and eternal God, as we work to praise you in the third millennium, send us an especially intense experience of creative inspiration. May the beauty which we endeavor to pass on to generations still to come be such that it will stir them to wonder. Your spirit has shown us that, faced with the sacredness of life and of the human person, and before the marvels of the universe, wonder is the only appropriate attitude. From this wonder may there come that enthusiasm needed by the people of today and tomorrow if they are to meet and master the crucial challenges which stand before us. May humanity, every time it loses its way, be able to lift itself up and set out again on the right path. May beauty save the world. Your beauty is a key to the mystery and a call to transcendence. It is an invitation to save her life and to dream of the future. And we know that the beauty of created things can never fully satisfy, but may it stir that hidden nostalgia for you. Beauty so old and so new, late have we loved you. May the many different paths of artists all lead to that infinite ocean of beauty where wonder becomes awe, exhilaration, and unspeakable joy. May these artists be guided and inspired by the mystery of the risen Christ whom the church in these days contemplates. May this art help to affirm that true beauty, which is a glimmer of your spirit, Lord our God, as it transfigures matter, opening the human soul to the sense of the eternal. And may the Blessed Virgin Mary be with these artists and patrons always. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father. So as I mentioned before, my name is uh, Dr. Jordan Haddad. Together with Abigail Reller, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight, we are the co-founders and the co-directors of the St. Louis the Ninth Art Society, um, a local Catholic art apostolate um, that we started a year ago this July to create a culture of art throughout South Louisiana. And it's for this reason that we put on this showcase event to give the faithful of, uh, of our local region an opportunity to encounter the faith in a new way through the medium of art and beauty. And so before we turn to our panel discussion this evening with our artists, I would like to offer just a very short reflection on the relationship between art, our faith, and the mystery of human existence. This world in which we live needs beauty in order to not sink into despair. It is beauty like truth, which brings joy to the heart of man, and is that precious fruit which resists the wear and tear of time, which unites generations and makes them share things in admiration. These words come from the Second Vatican Council, which concluded its four-year-long gathering in Rome in 1965 by issuing statements to artists, young people, scientists, workers, and world leaders. These words are over 50 years old, but they ring true not only today, but in every age, because they speak to the universal need of all people to not only know the truth and do the good, but to also experience the beautiful. Art, in all of its forms, ought to be a gateway to the beautiful. For the artist, if he or she is true to his or her vocation, is meant to give voice to both the transcendent desire of the human spirit and the mysteries of creation and the human experience, which issues forth from the all good, all wise, all beautiful God. And yet, as it often happens, art gives voice to either the deconstruction of meaning and values or banality and existential boredom. The blame for this, though, of course, cannot be laid wholly at the feet of artists, for they, more than the rest of us, feel this post-Christian world and the culture in which we live and give voice to it more honestly than the rest of us can or are oftentimes willing. What we as a people believe inwardly but are afraid or unable to say out loud the artist expresses in a deeply honest and penetrating way. 
This, anyway, was the opinion of the great South Louisiana novelist and philosopher Walker Percy, who once wrote that the artist is akin to the canary that miners would let loose in sight of a tunnel to see if it was filled with poisonous air or safe for human life. If the canary continues to chirp, then all is well. But if the chirping ceases, then trouble lies ahead. Artists, in other words, because of their inner sense and authenticity, are oftentimes more inwardly alert than the rest of us. They feel more deeply both the truth and falsity, goodness and evil of the world that the rest of us have created and live in. As humans, we need artists to reveal to us what lies beneath the surface or in the shadows of our culture. Because whether we realize it or not, we breathe the same air and live in the same world as they. As Catholics, we need talented, faithful, and devoted artists in our parishes and local churches because they are capable of drawing the rest of us more deeply into the mystery of God. And as St. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 1, the mystery of his will is part and parcel of our Christian faith that reality is far more rich, deep, and expansive than what we are capable of seeing with our eyes and touching with our hands. God, as the transcendent creator of all that is, cannot be put under a microscope, cannot be laid on the table, as it were. And this world and universe is more than just a blunt fact, more than just mere matter. Rather, it manifests the goodness, wisdom, and glory of the God who is himself divine love. Furthermore, God has revealed himself to be deeply personal by involving himself in the trajectory both of the life of the Israelites and Jewish people of the Old Testament and by virtue of the Son of God becoming incarnate and establishing the church as his mystical body in the new. We live in a world that is charged with meaning and a history that is shot through with purpose, even though sometimes we do not often experience it that way. To return to the canary example from before, we need Catholic artists to fly into the mystery of God and of Christ and to sing us an uplifting and inspiring song so that we can know that the path is safe and we're encouraged to follow them more deeply into the life of Christ and the mystery that he has invited us into. The Catholic artist, like a mystic, is one who is able to recognize this deeper reality and then draw the rest of us further into these saving mysteries by creating purposeful art that reflects the beauty of creation and represents God's redeeming activity and, act and purpose to us. Beyond this, Catholic art also inspires contemplation by both simultaneously quenching and at the same time deepening our thirst for God, which is part and parcel of our thirst for true joy, true meaning, true communion. This is true of all Catholic art, whether it be visual, musical, or literary. But when it comes to visual art in particular, Catholic artists transform our environment into a world, our church buildings into temples, and our houses into domestic churches and Catholic sanctuaries. Catholic art, when it's done with requisite skill, and issues forth from the wellspring of meditation and contemplation, it engages our senses so as to uplift our souls to God, bringing us into a deeper encounter with him and his plan so that we can in turn better know, love, and serve him. And so it's for this reason that Abby and I founded the St. Louis the Ninth Art Society. We believe that the images, signs, symbols, and colors with which we surround ourselves matter because we humans are those animals in whom God has breathed his life and bestowed a love for truth, goodness, and beauty, which is ultimately God himself. Unlike the rest of, creature, of the creatures on earth, we naturally desire transcendence. We naturally desire to know and love God by worshiping him. And when we aren't able to find this object of our longing, we inevitably end up worshiping something else, an idol which leads to sadness and ultimately despair. We founded this art society because we wanna build a culture of Catholic art that can renew our church from within, 
so that we might then in turn be a saving grace for the world beyond the church. This can only happen, though, by supporting local Catholic artists, all of whom who are present today have families. But these two goals are not mutually exclusive. They go hand in hand, because by supporting our local artists, by commissioning and patronizing them, they are not only able to continue to share their gifts with others, but the rest of us are able to in turn receive their work and create churches, schools, and homes worthy of the dignity of the gospel and of our Catholic faith. And yet, we recognize that art is oftentimes difficult to obtain because beautiful art can be expensive. This tension is felt especially by those people and communities who are unable to commission such artists as the ones present today because of their lack of financial resources, which leaves their parish, schools, and churches lacking the beauty which can feed their souls and assist them in their prayer and worship. And so it's for this reason that Abby and I um, are excited to announce the establishment of our St. Louis the Ninth Art Fund, which will be used to commission our society artists, the people here today, to beautify under-resourced parishes, schools, and ministries throughout South Louisiana at no cost to them. In fact, just this summer, we have our first two commissions being launched. If you are able to support this exciting new initiative or the work of SL9 more generally, then we would ask you um, to begin a conversation with either myself or Joe Bass, our director of development. There he is back there. The goofy looking guy. <laughs> so that we can explore together how you can join us in our mission to create a culture of Catholic art in the Diocese of Baton Rouge and surrounding dioceses. So I began this presentation by quoting the Second Vatican Council's message to artists. And I would like to conclude by quoting Pope St. John Paul II, who was himself a great artist, a poet, and a playwright. In his 1999 letter to artists, he wrote, in order to communicate the message entrusted to her by Christ, the church needs art. Art must make perceptible, and as far as possible, attractive, the world of the spirit, of the invisible, of God. It must therefore translate into meaningful terms that which is in itself ineffable. Art has a unique capacity to take one or other facet of the message and translate it into colors, shapes, and sounds which nourish the intuition of those who look or listen. It does so without emptying the message itself of its transcendent value and its aura of mystery. The church needs art, but it also needs people like you who see its value, its meaning, its purpose. So I would like to personally thank each of you for coming to our first Catholic Art Showcase in the Diocese of Baton Rouge. And with this, my presentation has come to an end. Um, so before I turn the mic over to Jacqueline Warren, who will lead uh, the final part of our programming today, which is uh, a, a panel discussion with our presenting artists, um, we'll first watch a two-minute video of Jacqueline creating this really beautiful St. Josephat image located here in the front right, which we are auctioning off tonight in support of the Ukrainian Cultural and Humanitarian Institute. So it's a silent auction, so if you're feeling generous tonight, besides uh, being heavy-handed with your donations at our two bars, if you'd also like to, to place a bid on this wonderful image of St. Josephat, all proceeds will go to support um, the Ukrainian Cultural and Humanitarian Institute. So while we watch this two-minute video, if I could ask our artists to please make their way to the stage.
All right, so um, we'll begin our panel discussion led by uh, presenting artist Jacqueline Warren. Um, she will engage in a short conversation with each of our artists, giving them an opportunity to talk about um, their creative process and how the faith you know, inspires um, the work that they do. All right, so um, as Jordan said, I'm Jacqueline Warren and I'm exhibiting, but I'm also filling in for Abigail who couldn't be here, so I hope I do as good a job as she would have done. Um, but uh, I have the, the section over there with uh, Divine Mercy. My husband, David, and I uh, created the book Brilliant. Shout out to my sisters from Pauline over there. <laughs> um, so uh, please stop by when you have a chance. But um, I'd like to hear from all of our artists tonight, as I sure, I'm sure you will too. Um, and we're going to start with Debbie. I have, a, I have a, a tough question for you. Everyone wants to know about the pigs. Right? What's up with the pigs? Right. What's up with the pigs? What's up with the pigs at a religious art show? Is is this projecting? Okay. A um, couple of years, not a couple of years ago, maybe a couple of months ago, I had an impulse to concentrate on animals in the New Testament. And this led me in many different paths, one of which was the discovery of numerous instances of pigs in the New Testament. One Sunday, the reading was about a town in Gadara, which Jesus entered, and there were two men possessed by demons. And the demons, of course, always recognized Christ, and they shouted to him, send us into the swine. So Jesus did this. He sent the demons into the swine, and the swine headed for the nearest cliff and plunged to their deaths. And, um, you know, it's a, very, it's a mysterious process engaging in religious art. And sometimes you think you're doing the work for one reason and you find out you're doing it for another reason. But that's the story of the Gadarene swine. And if you ever hear the phrase, a Gadarene rush, it refers to any event or movement that is headed for disaster. And I thought it resonated greatly in our culture. And so I, uh, that's the story of the pigs. A lot of people have asked about it. So I thought I would talk about the pigs. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Debbie. Um, yes, it's, it's a very curious piece. It, it, it's very intriguing. So thank you for sharing. Um, I'd like to move on to Andrew next. He's got a big project, y'all. Um, so I don't even know where you would start with building an entire sanctuary, but um, I'm hoping he can shed some light on that. And some of those pieces are here today, including the altar there. Hey, everybody. Um, am I holding it right? Y'all can hear me? <laughs> All righty. Um, so a little over a year ago, I was approached by a priest in Alabama whose cousin's actually in the Diocese of Baton Rouge Seminary. Um, his name is Father Vincent Bressoir, and they are building a new church for uh, Good Shepherd Parish in Russellville, Alabama. And I had already done some work for Sacred Heart here to restore some altar rails, and he asked me to make their entire sanctuary. And uh, I mean, I'm still learning as I go, to be totally honest. But the whole designing process has been very fascinating, learning how to create themes and the theological uh, patterns throughout all the church that are telling a full story. Um, but I would say one of the things that I've really been edified by is even just the little tiny, I've already made a prayer, bro prayer box that I was able to bring over there to show them kind of a, as an example of the type of work that I could do. Um, how much a simple piece of art can impact the daily lives of the people who use it. Um, and I, I, I've been uh, very moved by, this is a very poor Hispanic and Gua, uh, Mexican and Guatemalan mission parish in Alabama. And to have the ability to, in apparently this whole region of Alabama, this is the one parish that they all go to. And so to have the ability to create art that brings so many so deeply to Christ, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's something that is very moving and very uh, humbling. So, yes. Thank you. Great. Thank you. 
Thanks, Andrew. Um, I'd like to move on to Mr. Raymond Calvert, uh, one of our iconographers here. And um, what uh, I think I'd like to know, and I'm sure the rest of you would like to know, is what is the process of creating an icon? Um, and how does it differ from other artwork and other religious artwork? Thank you, Jacqueline. Um, there's an old New Orleans statement of putting Algiers into, putting New Orleans into Algiers, and the, the, the process is about doing that in a couple of minutes. It's on a wooden board, sealed, gessoed, and it goes from light to dark. The dark colors come first, and the process is called illumination. Illumination is what we're doing as a, an iconographer, as a person, that we become enlightened. So it continues through a long process of lightening each uh, layer, and then finally uh, putting gold leaf on it. And the leafing is to signify the enlightenment of that particular per person with the Holy Spirit. Icon is an image, and just remember that God created mankind in his image, and so all of you and all of us are images of God, and we need to reflect that. Each icon, theologically, is a witness to the Incarnation. Without the Incarnation, there would be no icon. Jesus became flesh, and therefore, we, can, we have seen him, we can depict him. He is the sole purpose of our craft. And for those that go to church and see an icon, they represent not only the person, but also the communion of saints that surround us in the church. It's a, a wonderful process. It changed my life. Uh, but I had been a painter, and it, I was looking for this all my life, and I found it. So, thank you. Thank you. All right, so next I'd like to turn to Norman and um, his latest piece, uh, which is to... Um, benefit those who are not only suffering with all, um, I'm sorry, dementia, and uh, as well as their caregivers. Uh, so the, a beautiful piece that he has started the preparatory drawing for, and we'll do the painting soon. So I um, want to hear more about that. All right. So uh, this is uh, um, all I have right now is a drawing, but eventually it's going to be a... Um, full-blown oil painting that we're going to be turning into uh, prints and prayer cards. Uh, I'm collaborating with uh, the Peace for Dementia Rosary, uh, my friend Matt Estrad. Um, and uh, basically it's just an apostolate in the Archdiocese of New Orleans and we're uh, just raising awareness that, um, you know, there's a way to uh, struggle through this or with people who have this uh, in a very grace-filled way, um, a very Catholic way. And uh, this apostolate is uh, just designed to um, educate uh, people about dementia and also, more importantly, to train the caretakers for the people who are um, uh, caring for these people, or, yes. And uh, so the image has Our Lady of the Rosary, uh, because you could struggle through any kind of suffering meditating on the rosary. 
Um, it has St. Raphael, uh, he's the patron of healing. Um, Archangel Raphael is also the patron of everything, of uh, <laughs> pretty much <laughs> um, daily human life. Uh, but uh, also people who struggle with mental illness, and definitely St. Diphna's in there. Uh, she's the, the patron of mental illness as well. And uh, St. John the Evangelist. And uh, he's the patron saint of um, caretakers because he takes Our Lady into his home and cares for her in her old age. So, does that answer? <laughs> Thank you. That's beautiful. Yes, and I learned something new. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I want to move on to Barbara. Uh, so you heard from Raymond about what the process of creating an icon looks like. So to take a little bit of a deeper dive, I'd like for Barbara to talk about one of her pieces specifically and what the process looked like for that um, from conception to creation. So <laughs> you can talk about the baptism. Yeah. yeah all right. Great. Um, ooh, okay. Like Raymond, I was a secular artist first, and it was so, ugh, so lonely and so empty and so, yeah. and then when I became an iconographer, it was just wonderful. But I'm not an intellectual at all, so when I, when I start painting, it's just like I'm bringing every single thing up, every blade of grass, every hair, everything. It's just like bringing it up, bringing it up, bringing it up to be just, what's the word, like not more spiritual, but just to get a sense of the spiritual world, I guess. So when I start, I just, you know, draw it out, and then it's, you know, the painting process starts, and then you're just constantly, like, working dark from light, but just bringing it up, and it just takes on this, I don't know, it's hard to talk about. <laughs> but it's really, really fun. Anyway, so I'm a happy artist, and so is Raymond. Are you guys? Yeah, it's really fun. <laughs> okay, that's... Uh, Do you want to talk about the baptism piece in particular? Well, the bap... Um, you were, the way you were explaining oh, yeah, how okay. you did it differently. Okay, well, I started, I drew it out first. And then, of course, I realized I probably should have read the scripture more. So then... <laughs> yeah, I know. So now, okay, so in my baptism, Jesus is like main thing, and John and angels and the water and God's kind of hiding up there. But then when you read it, it's like, no, it's like, and it's, and the heavens opened up, and God said, and it's just like I was saying before, if it was a musical, the big part would have been when the heavens opened up, not when, you know, he's putting the water over Jesus' head. So it was just, it was just humorous that now I have to redo it and make everything more about heaven opening up and God. I mean, they never really, you know, does anyone really talk about that? I mean, God was talking in a bellowing or something like that. It was really amazing. So, so anyway, so next time I'll read first and then I'll paint. Thank you. All right, lastly, um, I'd like to talk to Blair about uh, two new pieces that uh, she was commissioned to do. Very exciting about two wonderful ladies, St. Joan, my girl, and St. Therese. Uh, so I'd like for her to talk a little bit about uh, how she got started with uh, these saints in particular and um, how she was commissioned and what her artistic process looked like. So a dear woman who is here today commissioned this piece of St. Therese for Word on Fire for the um, Institute in Texas. And I wanted to represent the evangelical mission of Word on Fire. Um, and so St. Therese is their patron saint. She's also the patron saint of evangelization. And I wanted to show her presenting um, an image of Christ as the veil, and she also had a devotion to the Holy Face. She was of the child Jesus and also of the Holy Face, which is lesser known. And so I used the veil of Veronica as it's known in the West and in the East um, from the King Abgar, King of Edessa. So this um, 
we all know the story, at least, of the Veil of Veronica. Christ left an imprint of his face for us, and so she's, you know, using an image to evangelize, and so Word on Fire uses media and images and videos to do the same. Um, and then also, um, I've included the rose window of Notre Dame um, behind her, and then incorporated the gold leaf halo, which kind of forms a flower to um, reference her as the little flower. And then I wanted to um, represent um, her mission from heaven, that she said, my mission is just beginning, I'll send a shower of roses after my death. And so peacocks represent um, eternal life and the resurrection. And so they, the roses are you know, coming down, being showered. And then um, also there's a bit of delicate lace work on the bottom because her and her family worked as, um, especially her mother had a business uh, making lace and she worked a lot embroidering altar cloths in her life to give honor to God. Um, and then also I did um, a St. Joan of Arc, which um, a few things were given to me from the commissioner. One he really wanted was to have her heart kind of on fire for Christ and kind of like branding the armor and heating it up from within. And it kind of was like a prefigurement of that she already was on fire for Christ before she was burned as a martyr. And then also behind her, you can see kind of like plumes of smoke coming up, which allude to her martyrdom. And you can see the Seine River on the side. Um, and she holds the palm, which when you see that, that's a sign of martyrdom. So that's a little bit about those two pieces. Thank you, Blair. All right. Thank you all so much for coming, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of the exhibition. Thanks, Jacqueline. Uh, before we turn back to our viewing and our, our, um, our libations and our, our, uh, our, our charcuterie tables, I would just like to say a word of thanksgiving to our sponsors who uh, have made this event possible. So if you look inside of your program on page two, our Lady of Hope, Catholic Retreat Center um, near Chattawa, Mississippi, Almighty Storage in Prairieville, Serenity Oaks Memorial Park, right across the street from St. John's right here, and Catholic Community Radio have been major supporters of this event. Along with, on our very back page, Tin Roof, Brewing, uh, Tin Roof Brewery for donating all of the beer for this event, Robert's for donating all of the food for our charcuterie tables, and, um, and your own Knights of Columbus field agent, Marcus Bardwell, as well as Bayou Apparel. So a special word of gratitude for all of them for allowing this event to take place by their generous support. So with that being said, thank you again for coming this evening. I hope you have a wonderful time. We're, the, the viewing will remain open for the next hour and a half or so, so please, you know, we invite you to, to stay as long as you'd like, have another drink, get to talk with the artists and view their beautiful work. Thank you.